Hello and welcome to the Week in Parliament. On this programme, council tax bills will be going up to boost funding for social care, but opposition parties say it's the wrong way to tackle the problem. This is an unfair way to raise additional money, which will increase inequalities between rich and poor areas. The crisis in Syria. Was it a mistake for the Commons to reject taking military action against President Assad three years ago? I think we are deceiving ourselves in this Parliament if we believe that we have no responsibility for what has happened in Syria. And the Labour former Cabinet Minister Peter Mandelson weighs into the Brexit debate with a warning. You are risking a very severe deterioration in the UK uh, business environment. But first, the government's been facing pressure over social care for older and disabled people. At Prime Minister's questions, the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn dedicated five of his six questions to social care funding. The crisis affects individuals, it affects families and it affects the National Health Service. So why doesn't she do something really bold? Cancel the corporation tax cut and put the money into social care instead. This social care crisis forces people to give up work to care for loved ones because there isn't a system to do it, makes people stay in hospital longer than they should and leads people into a horrible, isolated life when they should be cared for by all of us through a properly funded social care system. Get a grip and fund it properly, please. When he talks about governments ducking social care, let's look about 13 years of Labour in government. In 1997, they said they'd sort it in their manifesto. They issued, had a royal commission in 1999, a green paper in 2005, the One List report in 2006. In 2007, in the CSR, they said they'd sort it. In 2009, they had another green paper. 13 years and no action whatsoever. Well, the next day, the government revealed what action it was going to take on funding the social care system in England. The local government secretary, Sajid Javid, announced measures amounting to an extra £900 million over the next two years. The plan is to let local authorities bring forward rises in council tax, what's called the social care precept. And money cut from a housing scheme will also be channelled into social care. So today I can confirm that savings from the reforms to the new homes bonus will be retained in full by local government to contribute towards adult social care costs. I can tell the House that we will use these funds to provide a new dedicated £240 million adult social care support grant in 2017-18 to be distributed fairly according to relative need. Last year, the government announced that councils would fund social care by a precept of 2% a year. In recognition of the immediate challenges that are faced in the care market, we will now allow local councils to raise this funding sooner if they wish. Councils will be granted the flexibility to raise the precept by up to 3% next year and the year after. This will provide a further £208 million to spend on adult social care in 2017-18 and £444 million in 2018 19. I ask gently of the Secretary of State is this really the best time to be choosing to cut corporation tax on Amazon, Sports Direct, and the big banks? Since the Prime Minister came to office, there has been much talk of help for those who are only just about managing their finances. That seems to have gone out of the window today. This is surely a truly feeble response to a national crisis and the LGA would be entitled to reject this proposal and put the ball firmly back in the government's court to think again. This is an unfair way to raise additional money which will increase inequalities between rich and poor areas. Now, the crisis in Syria prompted an emergency debate in the Commons on Tuesday. There were some powerful speeches as MPs pleaded with ministers to get aid to civilians and to stand up to President Assad and Russia. In his first speech as a backbencher in 13 years, George Osborne harked back to a Commons vote in 2013, when MPs rejected David Cameron's plans to take part in airstrikes against President Assad's forces. I think we are deceiving ourselves in this parliament if we believe that we have no responsibility 
for what has happened in Syria. Uh, the tragedy in Aleppo did not come out of a vacuum. It was created by a vacuum, a vacuum of Western leadership, of American leadership, British leadership. I take responsibility as someone who sat on the National Security Council throughout those years. Parliament should take its responsibility because of what it prevented being done. Meanwhile, a Labour MP warned about the activities of Russia. I don't think we have even begun to wake up to what Russia is doing when it comes to cyber warfare, not only their yep. interference now proven in the American presidential campaign, probably in our own, own referendum last year. We don't have the evidence for that yet, but I think it's highly probable. Certainly in the French presidential election, they will be involved, and there are already serious concerns in the, in the German secret service that Russia is already interfering in the uh, elections coming up. We've got to wake up to this. Ben Bradshaw there. Now, turning to domestic affairs, let's take a look back at the challenges facing politicians in Holyrood and Cardiff Bay. The Scottish Government has gained new powers over income tax, so there was a lot of interest in the Scottish budget on Thursday, unveiled by the Finance Secretary, Derek Mackay. We cannot accept, at this time of austerity, top earners benefiting from an inflation-busting tax cut. So I will limit the increase in the higher rate threshold to inflation and not give a substantial real terms tax cut to the top 10% of income earners. And plans to give more powers to the Welsh Assembly were discussed in the House of Lords on Wednesday. But the former Lord Chief Justice, Lord Judge, warned that the UK government would still have the power to overturn laws made in Wales. We have been discussing this legislation. It can be wiped out. Any part of it, primary, secondary, tertiary, whatever it may be, it can be wiped out by a minister without any consultation with anyone at the National Assembly of Wales. Here to explain the challenges facing politicians in Scotland and Wales are Ehu Gwar, our Wales correspondent, and David Porter, our Scotland correspondent. Well, David, starting with Scotland, so it's the first budget in which Scotland has been allowed to set income tax. What have they done with these new powers? What they've done is look at them and say we will fine-tune them a little bit. Essentially they are sticking to what the UK government is doing. Uh, the basic rate of tax is going to remain at 20%. But as we heard in that clip there, when you start paying higher rate tax, they are putting the threshold up by inflation, not more than that. So essentially, if you are a higher rate taxpayer in Scotland, you will start paying that higher rate tax a little bit earlier than you would be in England. Uh, these powers come into effect uh, in April next year. So from April next year, in very crude terms, the Scottish Parliament will have far more responsibility and far more power over the money that it spends. So there's been a lot of pressure from the opposition parties over this budget. Now we know what's in it. How are they reacting? What's, what's the kind of mood music been? Well, as you would expect, the Conservatives, who are now the principal opposition party at Holyrood, say that, in fact, this is a tax-raising budget. It is meaning that people in Scotland, if you follow the Conservative argument, are paying more tax or will pay more tax than people in the rest of the United Kingdom. Labour have decided to go on the offensive. They would have liked uh, a higher top rate of tax. They would have liked to have seen a 50, uh, 50 pence tax rate for the highest earners in Scotland and the Liberal Democrats are saying that actually there is a sleight of hand in all this. When you uh, look away from the income tax announcements, money is being taken away from local authorities in Scotland. Turning to Wales now, the Welsh Assembly has shut up shop, but the House of Lords has been discussing the Wales Bill. Um, could you explain to us the main points in the, in the Wales Bill? This is devolving more powers uh, to the Welsh Assembly, mainly on things like energy, transport, uh, elections, the way elections are run in Wales, even the name of the Assembly. It's also removing the need for a referendum before devolving income tax. So Wales will, if this is passed, have powers over a certain amount of income tax too, as in Scotland. Uh, it's also moving to a reserved model of powers, which is something Scotland already has, which is meant to make it simpler and easier to understand so that you presume that everything is devolved other than what's listed. However, there are, there are concerns that it's a, a little overcomplicated, let's say. Well, I ha there have been a lot of critical comments about it in the House of Lords and elsewhere. I mean, what, what are the key criticisms? Well, mainly on the, this, the reserve powers, the list is 
extensive on the amount of um, exceptions that are. They say it's too complex, will lead to uh, wrangling in the courts, which is exactly the thing that it's meant to avoid. There are also concerns that the UK government has veto over certain uh, powers in Wales and could stop things happening in Wales. Obviously, all this is set against the backdrop of Brexit. I wonder if we could just have a look at that in Scotland. How is that? kind of change the political atmosphere and the well, decisions. Well, you're right. Everything is being seen through the prism of Brexit, whether it be in Cardiff, whether it be in Edinburgh or Belfast or, of course, here at Westminster. And within hours of the Brexit result coming through earlier this year, Nicola Sturgeon was saying it was highly likely that there would be a second independence referendum. Slight rowing back on that now, but the constitutional question in Scotland is very much a live one. Um, and it is all tied in with Brexit. Depending on how the Brexit negotiations go, whether they're easy or whether they're hard, whether Scotland feels it is properly represented. Because we have to remember that although the UK as a whole voted to leave the European Union, Scotland, by quite a large majority, voted to remain. And in Wales, how has Brexit affected the kind of political discussions there about Wales's future? Oh, it's really dominated discussions in the Welsh Assembly, although very different to Scotland, Wales voted to leave. However, the majority of Assembly members wanted and campa actively campaigned to stay. So that slightly out of step with the national mood in Wales. However, they are very keen to make sure that Wales has a voice, that the specific concerns of Wales are heard and are listened to in these negotiations because Wales has received an enormous amount of regional funding from Europe. OK, last question on the future. Obviously, 2016, no one could have predicted what, what's gone on. Could I ask you to share any thoughts on 2017, how things are going to go, starting with Scotland? Very simply, Brexit will still be very important. It will dominate. It will dominate the relations between Holyrood and Westminster and between the Scottish Government and uh, the UK Government. We also have uh, local authority elections in Scotland in 2017 where the SNP could do very well. It means that it could take local authorities from Labour uh, in Scotland, which will mean that the SNP is in control at Holyrood and a lot of the large city councils as well. That's a double-edged sword. It means that the SNP will have the power, but also if things go wrong at a local level or there are uh, controversies at a local level uh, about spending and things like that, that it will be SNP councillors perhaps criticising the SNP government in Scotland. And similar for Wales, kind of Brexit? Yeah, it's going to be Brexit-tastic, isn't it, for everyone, I think, next year. But in the same way, we also have uh, local elections, and I think it'll be interesting to see uh, how UKIP do, seeing as UKIP now have a power base in the Welsh Assembly. Can they build on that in local elections following the vote to leave, or, or where does that leave them now that we are leaving the European Union? Thank you, Echu Gwa. David Porter, thank you very much. Theresa May has been attending a summit of European Union leaders in Brussels. She wasn't present at an informal dinner to discuss Brexit, but during official talks she said she wanted an early deal on the status of EU citizens in the UK and British citizens living in other EU countries. It follows another week of twists and turns in the Brexit debate. Mrs May has said she intends to trigger Article 50 in March, leading to a two-year exit procedure. But on Monday, the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, suggested in a session with the Treasury Committee that there might be a drawn-out transition period. There is, uh, I think, an emerging view among businesses, among regulators and among thoughtful politicians, as well as, I think, probably a, quite a universal view among civil servants on both sides of the English Channel, uh, that uh, having a longer period to manage... Uh, the adjustment between where we are now as full members of the European Union and where we get to in the future as a result of the negotiations that we will be conducting would be generally helpful, would uh, tend towards a smoother uh, transition and would run less risks of disruption, including, crucially, uh, risks of um, uh, risks to financial stability. Two days later, the Brexit Secretary David Davis had his first session with the committee set up to examine the UK's exit from the EU. The committee chairman, Hilary Benn, wondered what he'd made of the Chancellor's remarks about transitions and thoughtful politicians. Now, the Chancellor said on Monday there is an emerging view amongst business regulators and thoughtful politicians 
that it would be generally helpful to have a longer <laughs> period to manage the adjustment as we leave the European Union. Can we classify you, Secretary of State, as a thoughtful politician when it comes to transitional arrangements? Well, I'm not sure about the second qualification. I hope you can classify me as a thoughtful politician. Uh, in that context, um, let, me, let me be clear about where I think we are going. Um, firstly, as the Prime Minister said a number of times, I've said a number of times, what we're after is a smooth and orderly exit. That's the overarching aim. And uh, people get frustrated with us sticking to overarching aims, but the point is that's what we're trying to do. That's the purpose uh, of at least um, uh, a part of the tactic and strategy of this. Uh, and within that box, we want to get the maximum market access for British companies within, with the minimum of disruption. And so we'll do what's necessary to that aim. What if all of those things can't be negotiated within the, it could be 18 months, depending on well, Mr. what Barney view is taken? Well, Mr. Barney has said 18 months. Yes. Um, and I think that it is all negotiable in that time. I mean, that's the, that's the, uh, the, the sort of core of this, really. Um, we have got a lot to do, but that's one of the reasons. I mean, you may, thought, may have thought perhaps my opening answer wasn't that helpful, but it's one of the reasons that we are taking our time to get prepared on all fronts. After all, the Article 50 process was written to allow departure from the European Union. That's its purpose. And plainly, the, the architects of it, the authors of it, thought that it was time enough to do the job. The Brexit story moved swiftly on again on Thursday when Sir Ivan Rogers, the UK's ambassador to the EU, was reported as saying that the European consensus is that a Brexit deal might not be reached for another 10 years. The Labour former Cabinet Minister, Peter, now Lord Mandelson, happened to be giving evidence to a Commons committee that day. He was asked about the possible risks of Brexit. You are risking a very severe deterioration in the UK uh, business environment. Now, this deterioration is not going to happen straight away. Uh, that was the mistaken impression, in my view, given uh, in the uh, referendum. It will be a gradual... Uh, inexorable worsening of the conditions for business uh, in the UK. Uh, that's why those who say, well, it all seems to be going, you know, okay so far, are completely missing the point. It hasn't even, um, it hasn't even kicked off uh, yet. You'll be well aware, I'm sure, that Sir Ivan Rogers, the British ambassador to the EU, in a leaked memo today has uh, been revealed as saying that a trade deal will take 10 years to negotiate after Brexit. Can I ask what your gut reaction to that kind of uh, revelation is? Lord Mandelson said that sort of timetable was realistic if the government wanted a bespoke trade deal with the EU. I mean, while an agreement on the exit terms uh, will come earlier, because this negotiation uh, will come uh, first and can be approved by a majority uh, of the EU's member states, the separate, quite separate negotiation on what trade arrangement replaces our membership of the EU will be harder, it will be longer, and it will require uh, the approval of all member states uh, and their parliaments, not just a majority of them. Lord Mandelson giving his views on Brexit. Now time for a round-up of some other stories from Parliament. Nigel Owens, a top rugby referee, spoke to the Culture Committee about tackling homophobia in sport. He said that before coming out as gay, he had experienced suicidal feelings. I had to accept my sexuality, first of all, and, and it took me an overdose and a few days in intensive care and, and just only just coming back to life um, till I accepted that. So even though there were people there to help me and, and help me through this and tell me things will be okay, I can look back now and say, yeah, they were right, things will be okay in the end. But at the time, it was a lot of it was to do with me dealing with, 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 my, with myself. Um, and, and, and you're quite right in what you say there is, you know, we, we have to do all we can to make the environment safer for these people, no matter what age they are. It was the last Prime Minister's Questions of 2016. It started on a jovial note, with a few jokes at the expense of the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. In the light of the Foreign Secretary's display of chronic foot and mouth disease, when deciding on Cabinet positions, does the Prime Minister now regret that pencilling FO against his name should have been an instruction, not a job offer? <laughs> Mr. 
Schuster. too much noise in the chamber. We've heard the question, but I want to hear the Prime Minister's answer. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I have to say that the Foreign Secretary is doing an absolutely excellent job. He, he is, in short, an FFS, a fine Foreign Secretary. And now for a quick rundown of some other interesting nuggets of news from in and around Westminster. Here's Richard Morris with our countdown. Sleaford by-election winner Caroline Johnson arrived in the Commons this week as the 455th woman ever to have been elected as an MP. And that total now finally equals the number of male MPs in the current Parliament. Ministers faced three urgent questions on Monday as MPs asked about social care, the fox bid for Sky and the conflict in Yemen. The last time so many urgent questions were asked was in March 2015. Tory MP Peter Bone got into a bit of trouble on Thursday for an unusual choice of headwear when asking a question in the Commons. The hat was made by a local charity, but one glance at the Speaker and it was promptly removed. Margaret Thatcher has topped the Woman's Hour Power list on Radio 4. The list was compiled of women who had made a difference to real women's lives. Also featured was Barbara Castle. And season's greetings. Let's take a look at some of the festive cards from party leaders this year. Merry Christmas. Richard Morris. Now, as many of us sit down to Christmas leftovers on Boxing Day, spare a thought for the shop assistants who are back at work for the first day of the sales. A public petition has called for shops to be closed on Boxing Days. The government says it's not for ministers to tell retailers how to run their businesses, but the Labour MP Helen Jones recalled a time when the sales didn't start until January. Now, I confess, being a bit long in the tooth, I can remember when Boxing Day closure was the norm. It was a bank holiday. Nobody thought of doing anything else. Certainly all big stores were closed and people stayed at home with their families. In fact, I'm old enough to remember when the New Year sales actually began in the New Year after the 1st of January. So people stayed at home. If they wanted to go to the sales, they went later on. And here's the thing. Nobody starved to death. The world did not run out of cheap televisions, nor did the country run out of supplies of winter coats and boots at reduced prices. So I confess, when I first realised that people were shopping on Boxing Day, I would look at people going into the supermarket, I would look at the queues, and I'd think to myself, for heaven's sake, get a life. <laughs> However, I have moved from indifference to anger. And I have done so because all the evidence shows that poorly paid retail workers are being exploited to fuel a national obsession, a debt-fuelled shopping binge that, in the end, does no one any real good. Now, it's six months since the Labour MP Jo Cox was murdered in a constituency in West Yorkshire. She's still very much on the minds of MPs. As a tribute to Jo Cox, the parliamentary rock band MP4, along with several pop stars, have released a single. It's a cover of the Rolling Stones song, You Can't Always Get What You Want. Proceeds from the downloads will go to the Jo Cox Foundation. MPs remembered their colleague at Prime Minister's Questions. Sadly, Mr Speaker, our late colleague Jo Cox will not be celebrating Christmas this year with her family. She was murdered and taken from us. So I hope the Prime Minister, I'm sure she will, join me in encouraging people to download the song, download the song which many members helped to create, as a tribute to Joe's life and work and in everlasting memory of her. Yeah. Well, the, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely right to raise this issue. I'm sure everybody in this House, we should send a very clear message, download this signal, this si uh, single for the Joe Cox Foundation. It's a very important cause. Um, we all recognise that Joe Cox was a fine member of this House and would have carried on contributing significantly to this House and to this country had she not been brutally murdered. Um, 
it's right. I think the Chancellor's waiving the VAT on this uh, single. I think everybody involved in it has, uh, in fact, gave their services for free. I'm having a photograph with MP4 later this afternoon. Peter Wishart is a member of MP4. And, 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 and once again, once again, let's just encourage everybody to download this single. Well, that's it for me for now. Keith McDougall will be with you on Monday night at 11 for another roundup of the day here at Westminster. Until then, from me, Christina Cooper, goodbye. <laughs>